ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. Australia today is a hugely different country from the one my grandparents grew up in. The country is much richer, but the wealth is spread more unevenly. People live longer and have fewer kids. Australians once lived in small houses with large families. Now people are more likely to live alone in a bigger place, if they can afford it. Our big cities have become metropolises, and a population that was once drawn overwhelmingly from Britain or Ireland is now far more diverse and multicultural. But over the last few decades, the biggest changes have been driven by our ageing population. The demographic weight of one generation, the baby boomers, has been able to skew public policy to suit them to some extent. But now the millennials form the biggest generational cohort, and they've got different priorities. Dr Liz Allen is a demographer who studies population at the Australian National University. Liz is fascinated by the tidal changes in our population. She joins the dots between Australia's past and present to see what the trends are telling us about money and migration and social mobility and to see what our options are. Now, that last bit, social mobility, is of particular interest for Liz because becoming an accomplished academic was not something many people would have predicted for Liz's future when she was a teenager. Liz's early life was spent right out on the margins of Australian society. It was marked by childhood abuse and trauma, and homelessness and dire poverty. Liz had her first child, a daughter, when she was 17. And it was the arrival of this longed-for child that made Liz determined to get her life on track, despite everything that had happened. But crucially, she says there were a few arms outstretched to help her up. Liz Allen's book is called The Future of Us. Hello, Liz. Hello. You love demography. I know this because you say so in your book. Tell me why demography speaks to your soul. Demography is so powerful for me because it helps reveal the story of us and not just the blow by blow of what has happened, but rather helps reveal the structural forces, the systems that underpeg all of our lives, that helps us understand how we've come to be who we are, where we are and, and so on. So it, it reveals a deep connectedness of, of ourselves, not just biologically or, or socially, but rather to the roots of, of the country, the place, the community in which we come from. It, it's a, a superpower that enables us to stand in the present and look toward future possibilities and consider what options might be before us. You know, whenever I, when I read your book and when I've read George Megalogenus writing about this stuff, I find this stuff strangely reassuring. You say it's demography is a bit like a choose your own adventure story. Is that is yes. that because of choices that it puts in front of us? Definitely. I think there's a lot of chatter about the notion that demography is destiny, that where we've come from determines by default where we're going. And I look, I agree that demography shapes where we potentially could go, but I don't believe that it should be considered destiny. What makes me a bit cranky about the, the, the circumstances that we see Australia in at the moment is that we've given in to this notion that demography is destiny and that we just kind of strap in and, and go for the ride. That's not the case. We have within our grasp the opportunities to make change, we don't necessarily take hold of those and maximise the potential. So it's not so much a, a, like, to use another analogy, it's not so much like being on a railroad journey, on a railroad track. It's more like being on an open voyage in the open sea with all the opportunities and dangers that that offers. Th that's right. And, and I think that definitely the opportunities are somewhat constrained of, of what the future might ha hold for us. But small changes can alter those future courses. A lot of people also think that demography is like a, a fortune teller. And I think in some respects, 
it can be almost considered like I know what's going to happen next based on what's happened in the past type thing when it comes to population data, right? But a lot of that is about decisions and the decisions that we've seen leaders, policymakers and so on make are like a bit of the same old. And I think in that regard, we we can anticipate the future. But what I'm really encouraging people is to reimagine what is possible in the future. And we've been talking about an ageing population for quite some time in this country. I, I think since the Keating government, I think when <laughs> they introduced new superannuation laws. And our answer to that has repeatedly been to sustain quite a relatively high migration rate to keep the country young and to introduce younger taxpayers into the country. Now, we, we, our population at the moment, we're, we're just shy of 27 million, I think, at the moment. That's about right, isn't it, Liz? Yeah, yeah and I think that uh, it's anticipated that around Australia Day, we'll kind of tick over to, to 27 million. Now, during COVID, the COVID period, during lockdown, immigration was completely halted for two years. Yes. And since then, the tap's been turned back on. What would happen in Australia if, for whatever reason, we kept the tap turned off. What would happen to the population of Australia if we took in no migrants from now on? We have in the COVID period an example of what's known uh, in the business as a natural experiment. We have only to look to the COVID border closures to understand that kind of population experiment. What would happen if immigration were to go to zero zero net migration. What would happen to Australia? We would see marked structural ageing of the population, whereby proportionally more people in retirement uh, relative to the working age population. And we would see, therefore, a shrinking of the individual income taxpayer base. What that means is we would then have to learn very quickly how to do more with less. The spending on maintaining the well-being of the population, those needs would increase. And so we would have a shrinking income taxpayer base and we would need to do more with that. And we know that the government's pool of money comes largely from individual income tax. We would not see, like I think many people anticipate, housing become more affordable. We would not see wages increase. We would not see the kinds of job market changes that people anticipate. There is a false notion in this country that migrants inflate house prices, suppress wages and steal our jobs. That's simply not the case. We've we've proven those things not to happen during the COVID population experiment. And so we can anticipate that if if we were to see immigration return to net uh, overseas migration in the future, that we could anticipate much of the same. We wouldn't see a correction of the multiple crises that we see at the moment with regard to cost of living, housing affordability, and so on. So We've got to be careful here because people who come to Australia do so at quite a big risk to themselves. They, they're uprooting their lives to come to Australia to an environment that may not necessarily be welcoming. And we are asking them to contribute to our economy by way of income tax, yet we don't give much in return. We don't give entitlements to save Uh, for example, Medicare or or Centrelink safety nets and so on. So it's a lot of the Australian economy taking rather than reciprocating that relationship. In addition to that, we would have a cultural uh, shift and I think we'd become more um, protectionist in our approach to the world and to our place in the world. And I think that would then kind of make us turn upon ourselves We are very, very switched on and it doesn't take much for us to turn on ourselves. And when I say turn on ourselves, I mean turn on our multicultural community. Well, we see something like what has happened to Japan. 
I can remember in the 80s, Japan was the go-ahead nation. It was getting like 8, 9, 10% economic growth. The United States was worried that the Japan would one day eclipse it economically. There's, there were all these books written about Japan becoming the number one economic power in the world. Mm. And that's when the consequences of Japan's declining birth rate and its absence of migration really caught up with it. And so by the time you get to the 90s, you have anemic growth and the hollowing out of so much of Japanese society. Empty towns where people are now, mm. the government wants to pay people to come and live in these empty country towns in, in Japan. I, I know you can't really map Australia too easily onto Japan, but it does seem that that experiment's been played out in real time in a country like Japan. Indeed. I think that's a really important reflection to make. Our ageing population hasn't happened overnight. Uh, I, I, I like to refer to population change as a slow moving train. We can see it in the distance. We can anticipate where it's roughly going to go. And we do have levers that we can, we can change to, to change the tracks, if you like. And we can look to places like Japan and even China in some respects of what happens if we do something or don't do something what may lay ahead for us. So we have insights from other so-called population experiments, for want of a better phrase, to help guide us and to avoid making silly mistakes. One of the things that was revealed in the most recent census was that millennials had become a generational cohort that was, for the first time, equal to the size of baby boomers. And I have to assume now in the subsequent years, in the last uh, three years or so, they've become a, a larger cohort for the first time. And this, you know, the thing that's really struck me is that almost like the minute that millennials became the biggest generational cohort, the whole national conversation changed. National conversation is so much more about housing affordability, which had been sort of background music for a very long while. And now it's right at the forefront of the conversation as a major concern for younger uh, Australians. Have you noticed this, the, the change, the very rapid changing of the national conversation once the millennials became the predominant generational cohort in Australia? I think what we're seeing at the moment is a bit of a changing of the guard. I don't think it's just demography. I suspect that it's people being more vocal, commentators being more vocal, media more likely to print or publish or even air conversations about these sorts of things. So I think it's not just a demographic changing of the guard, there is a social changing of the guard that, hang on a second, the way that we're going may not necessarily be best for the future of the country. So maybe something needs to give, something needs to change. I suspect it is too too simplistic to say it's just demography because we've seen demographic change in the past and not necessarily seen that reflected in representation or in the expectation of societal norms. So there's more going on than just demography here, which I think is quite quite interesting and it and it gives us insight into the potential of how we can make social change by changing the narrative. Narrative control sounds quite nefarious, but that gives us insight into how we can have leadership in this country that creates change with minimal economic outlay. And that comes we're changing the conversations, talking about what is possible so that we reimagine or rethink different pathways or options for Australia. And, and by the way, you know, if we're thinking about housing affordability, maybe the way we've always done things is not the way we should be doing things now or do things in the future. You write about something called the ovarian lottery, which was a phrase coined, I think, by Warren Buffett, the billionaire. Yes, indeed. Uh, who uses it to talk about how our lives, the paths of our lives, are heavily determined by the circumstances of our parents. Tell me about the, where you grew up in the 1980s, Liz. So I grew up in Western Sydney, a few uh, stops away from the end of the train line, quite literally. Right, foot of the Blue Mountains. That's, that's right. exactly right. And so while considered kind of metro, we, we were definitely on the outer, on the fringe of Sydney. I was raised in a Catholic family. I was number seven child. My mother gave birth to eight children. Dad did the bulk of the, the outside work outside of the home, in the labour market. 
and worked very hard to provide for our family. And mum did all of the inside work, all of the the in-home labour, raising the children and so on. And so it was very quintessential dynamic of gender uh, roles and, and so on. Were they able to buy their own house? Yeah, so mum and dad, unlike most people of their generation, were were older to marry. When you say old, what, what, what kind of... What, <laughs> <laughs> I said older. I older. didn't say old. Right. I think my mother was about 25 and dad in his early 30s. See, that's that's pretty average these days. It, it certainly is. Well, average for dads, but not certainly not for the time. And so uh, by the time I came around, mum was 35 when she had me. And I remember mum being mistaken for my grandmother at school, <laughs> at, at school pickup. And, and that sounds so terribly awful because I think of my own children now and I think I would hate it uh, if uh, I was mistaken for their grandmother. In fact, that is not uh, how, you know, in, in that kind of generational change, how things have changed. I hear stories like that. I've, I've heard other stories like that that happens even today where at the school pickup, someone says to the mum, oh, you must be the grandmother. Yeah, no, mm. no. And I think that, I, again, that kind of shows how demography is a superpower, <laughs> right, is that we can link our lives and our own individual stories to this undercurrent um, of our national and our community history. And I think that's quite powerful that we can reflect in our lives and we can say, yes, we are a product of our times or, wow, things have changed and how things have changed. This, of course, is a rich story. It, you know, I, I, I tell students when I'm teaching that I don my cape of, of my superpower cape of demography and I kind of flick my long hair back and I stand nice and tall and proud and I clip my cape on and I can see the world more clearly and understand that perhaps I'm not the problem but rather the outcome of, of a problematic situation. So you, you're you in a family of eight kids in the outer, outer, outer western suburbs of Sydney. One income family, I'm guessing by the sound of things, was, was money super tight when you were a kid? I don't ever recall feeling like mum and dad struggled. And I suspect that's because they owned their home to begin with before they had children. That's something mum and dad were both working before they had us and mum had to stop. Of course, that was the times. And I believe that that was mum's choice anyway. We had hand-me-downs and there were occasions where excursions and things like that were were issues. And uh, the petrol in the car, we only had one car, a bright yellow combi van, that trips in the car had to be closely monitored. I remember that. But I don't ever remember my parents talking about money out loud. It was not, it was something that was never done. So there was a feeling of general security then for you for a long, well, for some time as a kid. When did that come to an end, Liz? I was um, diagnosed roughly about 10 or 11 as having severe obsessive compulsive disorder, which is not, by the way, a clean freak kind of, you just want things to be neat. Not at all. Um, um, I think my OCD came after I suffered abuse by a a relative uh, as an eight-year-old, not inside the immediate family, but a relative nonetheless. And um, from that point on, I enacted rituals, which is very typical for someone with OCD, so that I wouldn't be harmed anymore. As a kind of coping reaction? Exactly. It it was all-consuming. Were you able to tell your parents what had happened? Not at the time because I, again, I believed it was a normal thing and I didn't realise that it was wrong until kind of much later. And it took another perpetrator. Within a Catholic institution, I was abused by a teacher. And what happened when you and other students tried to report this behaviour? We were we were basically told by the senior people at the school, and I, this phrase will stay in my head forever. We 
would believe a teacher with 12 years teaching experience over a child of the age of 12. And so I refused to to go back to school. I'd had two years of it already. And so I moved to a local school and at the same time I was kind of treated very differently, more like a troublemaker at the new school, and that was hard. So where did you go, Liz? I kind of plotted along and finished primary school and then went to high school and because the abuse had stopped, I, I've, I felt like things were on track and for all intents and purposes it looked like things were on track but these things have a, a tendency to catch up with you and it was my second year of high school. It was very early on in the school year that the wheels well and truly fell off for me. I was put into an institution and, of course, when you lump a whole heap of kids with trauma and mental illness into an institution, you can imagine what occurs. There are predatory staff who try and take advantage of that. I wasn't able to reconnect with school despite attempts. I was, I think it was that at that point I realised I was very different I couldn't understand social interactions and I couldn't understand that bad things were allowed to happen. And with all of that happening, I think it was then a a natural progression to homelessness and to out-of-home care. So you write that it was was at 16 you became homeless? Yes. 16. What did that mean for you on a day-to-day basis? What what did you have that you could carry with you? So... (laughs) I laugh now because it was a garbage bag. I had a garbage bag and it had my essentials in it and a hairbrush, a wooden hairbrush that I'd been given for my birthday and home was wherever that hairbrush was. Who did you meet at this time, though, that gave you a safe or calm place to land? My partner. My partner and I met, well, we were 14 when we met. It was his family, his dad, who gave me a home. And so I, I had a safe place to go. And this is the same man you're still with today. It is. It is. Yeah. Did that give you some stability, Liz? It, it did. Uh, but poverty became you know, a major, a major uh, feature of, of my life and our lives. I became pregnant at 16 and had her at 17. And that, of course, changed things quite, quite a lot. Were you happy about that? Oh, my goodness. It was, uh, look, I, I hate to say it, but she was planned. I, I, I planned her. I, Why would you hate to say that? I wonder. <laughs> I, I think because it's an important feature of my life is that Establishing family. Family is really important for me. I remember holding her thinking, I have to get my life on track. I, ha- I, have to, I have to fix things for her. Given that you were just 17 at the time and you were living in really straightened circumstances, was, was there some pressure on you to give the baby up, to have the baby adopted? Yes, yes. So I, I recall attending the hospital to book in and uh, the only hospital in this town was a Catholic-run, government-funded public hospital. And uh, it's something seared into the back of my mind where we were kind of sitting on these chairs and the, the midwife taking the, the booking. And th- this is in like, this is like 90, 97, right? 96, 97, we're in this room and, and behind her on the wall was a crucifix. She's got a, a clipboard and she said, you know, not even looking up from the clipboard, so you'll be giving this baby up for adoption. I went, what? <laughs> no, um, I will not be giving this baby up for adoption. Uh, I fought very hard ever since to keep her uh, and to keep the family intact. So that's what gave you this moment of clarity, you say. Yeah, your yeah. Your, ba- your first baby. That's what, right. What, what kind of clarity did that bring? What kind of resolve did that give you? 
it gave me the realisation that I, as I said, I had to get my life back together. I didn't want to continue on the pathway that I was certain it was going and I wanted to be a role model to her. I wanted to be a strong woman. Podcast, broadcast, and online. Conversations with Richard Feidler. Liz, you were saying before that it was the birth of your daughter that made you determined to get your life on track. How did you go about doing that? Uh, it took time and it was rocky. It was very rocky. You know, we, we had no money and we, we lived further out at this point with no connection to public transport really. And I decided, okay, I'm going to finish high school. That's the first thing I need to do. So when she was about 18 months, I returned and finished high school through TAFE. And the only place I could do my course was at Mount Druitt TAFE. And it was a, through public transport, it was a pretty big trek to get to Mount Druitt TAFE. Um, and, sorry, I'm, um, I'm sorry, I'm just struck by the fact that most people who live in Sydney would think of going out to Mount Druitt TAFE would be like an outward bound journey of massive proportions. But yours was an inward bound journey it was, it, it of was massive in, proportions? <laughs> it was an inbound journey. <laughs> right. And, um, um, I still remember the kind of um, just the nastiness on the train, like kids in private school uniforms because I would go on the Blacktown line and then from the Blacktown line I'd have to get on, on the Mount Druitt and change tracks and just the, the, the nastiness from yeah, particularly kids in school uniforms on the platform and then on the train. And what, were you called, were you accused of being povo or something yeah, like that? Yeah, oh, look, I was povo. Yeah, there, was right. no, there was no denying that right. at all. But I think what, what, what cut deep was that we were lesser humans mm. and that just, gosh, that stung. I just remember thinking I am now not the person who I chose to be or that I set out to be and, and equally neither are they. They are there by accident, by happenstance, by virtue of the ovarian lottery. They were lucky and my circumstances were not. And I think that that's what hurt the most was that I was equally human but I was being denied that humanity. So how did you go when you started studying again? It was incredible because there was dedicated supports for people just like me. So maybe that support, that's the one social strut there for you. It changed your life. It it did indeed. And it was having people there who then kind of said to me, what are you doing next? And what do you mean? I'm just going to finish year 10 and then I'm going to do year 12 and then we're done. And no, it was okay you're going to apply for university. This is not the end. And what did you say? Oh, my goodness. Not like that. What I I think uh, I wanted to say, (laughs) I can't for radio. Um, But (laughs) it was like, hang on a second, you kind of think I'm worthwhile? And this motley crew of young people who, for whatever reason, mainstream had failed, we thrived because we had the right educators and the right support and the realisation that, you know, okay, you don't have money for a meal, you might be hungry today or, you know, here's a, here's a you know, a piece of frozen toast, you know, or whatever, you know, we got by, we muddled our way through. So I, I had grand goals at that point. I decided... I would enrol in something that I was pretty certain I wouldn't get into. (laughs) And I got into it. What was that? My first preference was for 
applied chemistry uh, at... Get out. Uh, applied the chemistry? Uni- wow. the, I, who would do that? Coming up at, through Mount Druid TAFE into applied chemistry. That's amazing. And I got in and I got in and I hated every minute of it. You did? Um, I did. Um, but what was so incredible, I remember at the Centrelink office... You know, I had my change in circumstances. I had to show paperwork and things like that that I was going to be studying. And they took one look at what I was studying and my acceptance offer and, like, looked at me and, like, I'm pretty certain she nearly fell off a chair. <laughs> and as she's, like, photocopying it, she's going, oh, my God. Like, like she was so proud of me. Look, it's hard to impress a Centrelink person. <laughs> And I just thought I have I have made it. That's right? fantastic. But but nonetheless, when you got in front of a Bunsen burner, you decided oh, it, wasn't it was for horrendous. Me. It was not me. I I was not destined to be an applied chemist. But that's what you're supposed to do at uni. You're supposed to try things, and you go, oh, actually, uh, this thing I thought I'd try, uh, it's not good. For me, but exactly. I can do something else. So, exactly. And, and and how do you get from applied chemistry to to demography? Though? Well, see, I I had this goal of I would then become a forensic science, and I would like count dead people. So it's not like a long bow to then <laughs> a, kind of like measure and understand dead people. Right, you're going to be sculling in the X-Files. That's exactly you, right, right. So I then kind of went to counting dead people, <laughs> among <laughs> others. But demography, I fell into demography by accident. And so I moved to Macquarie University, which, by the way, was a train ride and a bus ride away from where I was. And so it was like a two-hour trip just to get to university. Still, there are a lot of private school kids that go to uni and some of those those kids that taunted you on the train, no doubt as well. Uni is supposed to be beyond all of that, but nonetheless, were you given a hard time for being a bogan or something like that? Oh, massively. I dressed like a bogan. I sounded like a bogan. I, I, I was not able to hide my boganness. Put it bluntly, I had to make decisions most days. Do I go to uni, pay for the, the public transport, or do I eat? So many days I didn't eat. That would they were just decisions, much like TAFE. They were the, the the sacrifices I made to get there where I needed to be. And so I think I was probably a little bit surly and angry seeing all of these rich kids turn up in like really fancy cars and bemoan having to come to university. I was the person that sat up, and I was considered mature age by this point. I was up the front, like, you know, I was paying for this stuff, right? Well, as in hex, I was going to pay for it later. I may as well get my every cent from this. And that was not looked upon kindly by the well-to-do folk. And I didn't do well, let's be honest, because... I barely passed my first year and I was juggling part-time work and care for kids. So it's not surprising that I didn't do very well. I had to go to the local library to to use a computer to do my type my assignments up. So there was all of this time that was spent not being able to to do the kind of education and, and work stuff that made it an exhausting process. But I ploughed ahead. And I had to, at the same time, I had to take a series of electives and on the list of elective options was jurisprudence and demography. And I couldn't say jurisprudence at the time and I didn't really know (laughs) what it was. And so I thought, look, demography sounds all right, so I'll do that. So I fell into demography by accident because I just didn't want to do law. And it was like, oh, my gosh, like angels came before my eyes and and that was the, the moment I donned my demography cape because I realised that the circumstances of my life were not my fault and that was profound. So those private school kids on the Blacktown, Western Sydney train station platform they were just as responsible for their lives as I was for mine, except they had luck and I didn't have opportunities. And so it was at that point that I went, okay, this makes total sense. Now, I couldn't afford the resources, so I had to attend every single lecture, every single tutorial without fail. And I recall my daughter got sick 
and I was juggling work and, and uni and I kind of went up to the lecturer and I pleaded with them, you know, I've missed this lecture, can I get your notes? And he said, he said, no, we don't do those sorts of things here at university. You'll have to make a friend. I went, oh, hell, this is, no one wants to be my friend, but I made a friend out of need. I got the notes. I barely passed the course. But the next year I did better and I did better the year after and I did better the year after, d- despite the fact that I had two kids, was working part-time. At the same time, my partner, he was pursuing his education because he, he hadn't finished high school either, so he was doing that and pursuing his degree. And I think that I was lucky I had that situation. I was lucky of, in some respects of my poverty, because I appreciated every moment of what I had. And then I applied after I finished uni for one job at the Australian Bureau of Statistics. So we moved to Canberra and that was, it was like the beginning of the rest of my life. I had a more stable job. I felt like I was privileged, but no matter where I went, I was still odd. I'm still very, very neurodiverse appearing. I'm flamboyant in the way I kind of dress and speak and and I think that that, that stood out and I, I remember being taken aside by someone quite senior in, in the Bureau and being given a book and it had a peacock on the front and it was basically how do you fit in when you're a peacock. So I've <laughs> never thought of myself as a peacock but clearly I am a peacock and I'm just thinking, okay, so I'm peacock now. And I tried really hard to more <laughs> feminise my voice, to make myself less flamboyant. I wasn't deliberately being flamboyant. I just, I spoke truth. I, you know, I never hid from that. And I had my third child and got hit by terrible, terrible postnatal depression. And I, I had to resign from public service. And it was that point I thought, okay, this is all over. My life is now over. And I've ruined it for everybody. And um, my partner said to me, well, you really should keep busy. You should enrol in a master's course. I thought, what the hell is he talking about? The last thing I can do, I am a broken human at this point. You want me to enrol in a master's degree while we have absolutely mo- no money whatsoever? And um, I did it because I just wanted to shut him up. And I did really well. I got straight HDs and at ANU. And it made me realise again that with the right supports, with the right opportunities, one can flourish no matter where they come from. They just have to be given the right opportunities. And by this point, I'm, by the way, I'm still Yobbo, still really not fitting in. One of the senior academics said to me, have you thought about applying for a PhD? And it was like history repeating itself. I went, nah, but now I have. (laughs) But I couldn't have done it without a scholarship. I was, you know, really, really struggling financially we were. I remember I, I didn't get the first round of scholarships and this academic said to me, Liz, you need to write a letter. And you need to write a letter to this person, senior person, a very, very senior person at the university, and you need to tell them a bit about your story. Now, at this point, I'd never, ever told anyone in power my story and how my story was different to the norm. I always pretended that it didn't exist. And I'd stuff it. I'm going to do it. So I wrote a letter to this person and I said how unfair and discriminatory this process of granting scholarships was because of my educational background. I didn't go to a private school, didn't finish school. You'd been homeless. Yeah, look, look, you know. And what surprised me to this day is a very senior, well-known demographer then went into bat for me. And it was at this point that I felt like I'd found my place, that... I was meant to be here. So now you have a PhD. I do. What was it like the day you got your PhD? Do you recall it? I do. 
I, I remember the university asking me to speak to, I think it was like the local, the local nine equivalent asked me to appear and the headlines were something like, from dropout to PhD. And I was so proud because I had my four children, uh, three could walk and one I held in my arms with me on this day. And it was, it was just incredible. I didn't fit into my shoes. I could barely afford the gown that I was in. I remember I was the first one across the stage. I didn't know what to do. And when you do get a PhD, you wear a fuzzy, fluffy hat and you you have to kneel. And kneeling and getting up from kneeling when you're nervous is not, not something that's easily done. And I remember making my way across the stage. I'm the first one because of alphabetical order. And I remember kneeling down thinking, I can't get up. And my shoes didn't fit properly, so they fell off. <laughs> and I quickly sucked it back up and I stood up. And it was Gareth Evans, uh, who was the Chancellor at this point, and and I looked to him and I thought, I'm going to throw up all over Gareth Evans. <laughs> and so the only thing I could do was say, I'm going to cry. And Gareth Evans grabbed me in this kind of monkey grip on both elbows of my arms and says, you can do it or something. And in that moment, I went, damn right, I can do this. I sucked those <laughs> shoes back on and put myself together and, and walked across that stage and there I was. It felt like it took for ages, but I think it was like seconds and it's um, seared into the back of my memory. And so I think from then on, it, the, the weight of responsibility has been quite heavy. I know not everybody in my group of motley weirdos from Mount Druitt TAFE and so on have survived. I know not everybody has achieved what they wanted to do. I, and I, I know kids, you know, ward of the state who um, have spent most of their life in prison and will likely spend the rest of their life in prison. And I, I, think, I think of them often and I think about the opportunities that we all had and I think about the opportunities that I've had. And the only thing that separates us is luck. And the intervention of some the right people at the right time. Like, as I'm hearing your story here, Liz, I'm imagining myself, if I'm one of those cold-hearted bean counters yep. in the Treasury building, and I look at your story and I, I, what I see is a small, small, tiny investment of someone at that TAFE who's there to support teenage mums and the encouragement you got from the people there to go on and keep going and transforms a citizen like you who might otherwise, people in your circumstances, often don't have very good outcomes at all. There's often drug dependency, there's homelessness. That's right. Nonetheless, a timely social investment leads you to flourish as a human being. That's right. And it's cheap. It's cheap investment because they're not just there for me, they're in, there for a group of people. I think what was what, what angered me most about all of that was that the two key educators at TAFE were not paid year round. So when we had holidays, session breaks and so on, they had to work other jobs because they were not paid in the off season. And they were the very people that ensured that I wasn't a lifelong user of Centrelink and that maybe I wouldn't then pass on my dependence on welfare to my children. And so if you think about it in those sorts of costs and, and benefits, we are not paying these important key workers fairly and we are not supporting them adequately. And I think what makes it even worse is, is a lot of those supports have since been lost. Those programs have gone. And so the program that saved me no longer exists. And I, I feel such grief and anger for that because, as you say, it is cheap and it is over the life course of a person, not just morally right, it's, it's economically right. So I'm extended to pull you into a lifeboat. You know, I've, I've talked to journalist Rick Morton about this and he's new terrible poverty throughout his you know, life and he's, he's constantly aware of how little the rest of Australia knows of 
poverty in this country. Yes. How incredulous they are to know it. Many people are to know it even exists. Yes. Bundled up in that is individual shame, shame that we feel ourselves and shame that society puts on us. This is a learned strategy to, I think, to keep people from changing things. Definitely the shame that I felt growing up, I didn't ever want to speak about it. And I speak about it now because, as I said, that responsibility I feel for being the role model that that young people need to see, that they can survive, that they can thrive. It's just about getting the right supports and mentors to, to pull them through and up. One thing that Rick and I agree on quite wholeheartedly is that Poverty and those experiences stay with you. They are burned into your DNA. Research shows this, that it it might be a transitory moment of your life. Say, for example, a lot of researchers will say teenage pregnancy, teenage motherhood is just a moment in time and you age out of that. You're no longer a teen, so you're no longer a teen mum and the outcomes aren't so bad lifelong, or they'll say just because you experience poverty growing up or poverty until your early 20s or whatever, just because you're not experiencing it now doesn't mean it doesn't have an impact. Oh, no, it can be like a lacerating trauma. It, it is. And, and what then happens is it changes a lot about how you live your life, the decision-making that you go through and so on. So there's a lot that we don't know, and I think that we're not keen on knowing about poverty and the way that it hurts individuals in Australia. Is there a kind of sense memory of it? Even though you've got a a great job now and you you live a much more stable life, you're a respected academic and an author indeed, are there moments when you can sniff something or see (laughs) something or taste something that, that, oh, there it is again, that, that sense, that's the shock of the memory of, that sort of takes you back to homelessness and desperate poverty. Definitely. As you say, I'm, I'm in a very privileged and lucky position, but I still carry all of the lifelong trauma. So there are very quick triggers. I'm still renting. I will likely never own a home, so I don't have secure housing. And that hurts. It hurts that I will gift that to my children. That kind of intergenerational transmission of being a non-homeowner the the current bank of mum and dad situation is something that makes me so angry. Why am I any less a person? Why am I any less entitled to security because I didn't have that in- transference of wealth? It's unfair and we see more and more now, we see a, a widening gulf between generations and that unfairness hits me in the gut and, and it hits me in a way that reminds me of all of the hard things that, you know, of being seen, of shedding that shame and so on. It never goes away. And I think the only way it goes away for me is by advocating for others, is by doing work. And let's be honest, I'm a non, I, I think a lot of people would consider me a non-traditional academic I reckon. Yeah, oh, damn right, I reckon. Um, I, <laughs> there's a, a meme that goes around of, of Big Bird sitting in a, a corporate office and Big Bird sitting among humans, and it's something like um, when you walk into a meeting and you know not, you know you don't know what you're doing, I'm Big Bird. I am the peacock, <laughs> the flamboyant Big Bird that sits in a meeting uh, kind of from a working class povo background that goes how you're doing, what she's up to, that kind of thing. And I've got to the point where I'm okay with that because I know it makes some people uncomfortable and I want the people that feel uncomfortable to feel uncomfortable because that's the only way we change things. In elite institutions like higher education, I want to ensure that we get students who don't look like the traditional student but they're there and they're looking to people like the big birds in universities going, oh, my God, I can be this because I can see those people. They've achieved it. I can do it too. It's been great speaking with you, big bird, (laughs) and enlightening as well and completely fascinating. Thank you so much, Liz. Thank you. You 
You've been listening to a podcast of Conversations with Richard Feidler. For more Conversations interviews, please go to the website abc.net.au slash conversations.